All right, everybody, I think we can get started here. So thank you all for coming bright and early. I'm excited to, to kick things off uh, today. Um, my name is Kyle Rich. I'm uh, an associate professor in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies here at Brock. Um, also, I have some connections to the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, so if you saw the posters out front, um, associated with that organization as well. If you haven't seen the posters, check them out. They're, uh, they're show beasts. <laughs> they're, they're special. Uh, we've also got our, our banners over there. Um, so I just start off, we, we've set this up as kind of an open panel today. We just want to have a kind of free-flowing conversation. So we're not going to do presentation, presentation, presentation. We're just going to talk. So if anybody has uh, things you want to jump in with or talk about as we go, please feel free. Uh, but we'll also save some time at the end where we'll open it up to kind of a broader discussion, uh, get your questions, but then also We've got some questions for you to try to engage you in this discussion as well. So we really do want it to be a little bit more kind of free-flowing and less conference-y, you know, get us, get us going and talking at the start of the day. Um, so feel free, certainly feel free to jump in at any time. Same thing online, if people are asking questions, put your hand up, we can, we can pause that and, uh, and have that uh, talk as we go. Um, so I'll start telling you a little bit about myself, and then I'll let each of them introduce themselves. Um, so as I said, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies. Uh, my background is in kinesiology, so I came through kinesiology programs, and for my PhD work, um, I worked with a rural community um, recreation committee and looked at the way that they manage sport and recreation in their, in their community. And then that kind of like built into this research program where I'm straddling the sport and recreation world and the, the sport, or yeah, sport and physical activity world, I guess. So kind of a foot in both of those. Um, and that's how I kind of came to be interested in this stuff. Um, so in the panel today, um, oh, so I want to give one other plug before we get started. You can see my slide up here. Um, we've got an article on here, but we're also working on um, a, knowledge, a series of knowledge mobilization events we call the Northern Dialogues. Um, so we've got webinars happening, we've got a conference happening. Uh, this is with a group of colleagues from the Canadian Rural Revitalization Foundation, as well as UConn University. So if you scan the QR code there, you'll go to our website. I do want to make a specific plug. We have a webinar happening on Monday about um, research capacity in northern communities, so speakers from uh, the Northwest Territories, Yukon, um, and Nunavut. Uh, and then that's our kind of warm-up webinar, and then we've got a conference that's happening. It'll be a hybrid conference, um, so there's the virtual option to join. That's happening in May, and that'll be a full three days, and it's really exciting. Uh, we're going to be in Whitehorse, uh, but if you're into this stuff and want to do another conference in person, you can still come join us at Whitehorse, or virtually, you can join there as well. So uh, please check that out and uh, share it with uh, any colleagues or people you know who are teachers. Okay, so uh, today we wanted to talk about uh, this idea of social infrastructure. So often when we define rural places, we think about kind of physical things, right? Distance and density, um, how far, how many people are there, how far away they are. And then a lot of the, maybe the, the policy talk or the public talk that we get is often about economies or economic development, right? So um, what makes a, a rural place a rural place? It's often the economy that's there, right? It's a mill town or a fishing town or a logging town. Um, and so, you know, this is reflected in our policy as well. We have a Minister of Rural Economic Development. Um, so we, we talk about these things in that way, but um, we also then talk a lot about how rural communities are resilient and they're constantly overcoming change. Often this is a downturn in the economy, right? The, the mill closes or the mine closes and this changes it. But when we talk about this idea of resiliency, it's about more than just economics, right? It's about the way that communities come together. It's about how people are connected, what kind of relationships are there, what kind of organizations are there, um, what family life looks like, and how people are able to stay and make a living in the community. So there's this other part of rural communities that's really important, and um, we're, we're kind of using the umbrella term of social infrastructure, right? So not the economic, not the physical infrastructure, but the social infrastructure. So Infra Infrastructure Canada um, defines social infrastructure as um, things that support housing, childcare, community culture, and recreational facilities. So if you were, you know, you wanted to build a new arena in your town, you would apply to Infrastructure Canada through the social infrastructure stream. Um, but then when you look at kind of lower and you move down to the kind of community level, uh, we define it a little bit more broadly. So for example, the city of Vancouver defines social infrastructure as physical spaces, services, or programs, as well as the networks across and within these physical spaces 
um, services and programs. So a much kind of broader uh, definition there, um, and considering uh, I really like that idea of networks, right? The relationships within and between these things um, that make things work, right? Um, from the you know the social capital language, uh, the social lubricant, or the glue that holds the community together. Thinking about all of those things. So all of us here uh, do research in one way or another on this idea of social infrastructure, right? So the networks, the relationships, uh, the organizations, the way that, that people come together. Um, and that's what we really wanted to focus on here because uh, we think that's a really important thing. And uh, it's important thing to also tease out that's separate from the fiscal infrastructure and the uh, economic development kind of things that we talk about a lot. Certainly related, I'm not saying they're not related, but a, a separate conversation that I think is an important one to have. Um, and you know, we saw some of this yesterday in the sessions on identity and language, right? These are all um, social issues that are really unique in rural places. Um, so I think this is a, an interesting stream that's coming out of these discussions today that I'm excited to uh, talk about a little bit more. So with that, I'm going to kind of pass it along and we're going to um, go through each person. Um, I'm going to start with just the basic intro questions and then maybe we'll come back and get the more specific questions. Um, so we'll start with Grace. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your research. Good morning, everybody. My name is Grace Nelson. Um, I finished my master's last December uh, with the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences here at Brock in the Department of Rec and Leisure. So I've always, and I did my undergraduate in Rec and Leisure as well, so I always have that kind of passion for recreation, community sport, and kind of looking at community capacity and in different community contexts, what that might look like. Specifically with my master's research, I was looking at social inclusion in um, rural communities and in sport and recreation and how social inclusion was understood, practiced, where it might be a policy. I'll get into that more later, but just gives you a bit of a background of how I have this interest of sport and recreation and bringing it into understanding rural communities and history and political identities and social identities and how all of those things intertwine. Um, and now I'm working here at the university as the coordinator of two research centers, one being the Center for Sport Capacity. So continuing on that idea of moving along this important knowledge, information, research, and sport and recreation out into the community and keeping that knowledge mobilization happening. But it all started with rural and understanding those rural communities and um, people working in there, practitioners in sport and recreation. Yeah, I think that's a, the overview of me. Vivian? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Vivian. I'm an international student um, currently in my final, my second and final year for my master's in the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences. Um, I'm interested in access to healthcare in rural areas. Before I came to Brock, I did some nonprofit work in that field. And coming to Brock and coming to Canada, um, conversations with international of students like me or newcomers like me um, spurred me to pique my interest in looking at how newcomers or newcomer healthcare workers in rural areas are adapting. Yeah, I feel like that's, that sums it up. Well. My name is uh, John Dale. I am a, a PhD student in rural studies at the University of Guelph. I recently wrapped up my master's in rural planning and development. Uh, my research uh, deals with mutual aid and third places in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, specifically more at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. I have to kind of get into the more granular piece of, uh, pieces of what those two things are, but kind of relationality and how that interacts with both physical and digital place. Um, and for me, that kind of rural piece, you know, the geographic scope of that, that is where I'm from. I'm from Nova Scotia. I've lived in New Brunswick for six years, so I've got a huge attachment to play. So that was kind of the compelling thing behind, behind the, the geographic scope of that. And so I wanted to dive deep into kind of, uh, kind of this transformative uh, community building happening, you know, uh, in a time of crisis. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Great, I'm so really excited to have these three here. I've been, I've been fortunate enough to work with all of them in, in some capacity. Um, I do want to do the, a bit of a caveat that 
Grace Rubin and myself, all of our work was from the same region. So uh, we're, you know, and we always say, you know, one rural community, you know, one rural community. I'm talking about one, but we're talking about one region that's kind of similar. John, your work was uh, Eastern Canada, so um, a little bit different context. Um, I want to come back to that at the end and kind of open up a discussion about different places and the things that they're experiencing. But I do just want to make that caveat that the first three of us here, uh, probably similar kind of context that we're, we're thinking about there. Okay, Grace. Um, so let's start with you. Um, what does sport and recreation look like in rural communities, and why do we need to think about it as differently, as a different context uh, from urban? So yeah, so my research was looking. Uh, it was qualitative research. It was a case study in northern Ontario um, in Nipissing and Sudbury district. And I was trying to understand how sport and recreation practitioners and managers understood sport and recreation in their region, how that might be tied to community social identity, and also how they understood social inclusion. And um, the way I did that was looking at document analysis of what social inclusion, how social inclusion was being talked about in publicly available documents, and also how sport and recreation was kind of understood within the regions that I was looking at. And then I was also trying to understand in semi-structured interviews speaking with sport and recreation practitioners, their understanding of sport and their community. And more specifically, um, the rural and northern immigration pilot was something that kind of sparked my interest for this with the encouragement of new Canadians going moving to rural spaces. How were people in um, northern Ontario and in the same separate district um, understanding social inclusion, how are they understanding new Canadians' experiences and having people of different cultural backgrounds and ethnicity races coming into the region. So it's kind of like a little bit of background on that. And then more specifically, kind of what sport and recreation looked like in that context was I think through my conversations I started to understand it's really um, it's really motivated and understood in terms of different social, political, and historical factors, right? So a lot of the times that people are coming together in rural regions in the literature and kind of with the people that I spoke of um, are coming together for sport and recreation, it could be tied to something historical about their community, and that might be why they're coming together for a sporting event. Or it could be tied to something social, like you have an understanding that someone in the region wants to come together for a certain recreation program and we're all going to kind of work together to make that happen. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar and a lot of the things that came up in my research, well, this kind of term was tight-knit community. So that's talked about a lot um, and that has a lot of connections to sport and recreation as well in rural communities. And you could kind of think about how that would be really positive because it's bringing people together, but then also kind of understanding how that might be a bit of a barrier for participation because if we have that term tight-knit community, there's naturally someone who's going to be left out of that. So that's where I was kind of moving with my research to understand how newcomers, um, not newcomers' experiences, but the experience of sport and recreation practitioners understanding social inclusion and what it might look like to include newcomers in programming. So yeah, to answer the question, sorry, I went on a big tangent, I just want to give a little bit of background. But to answer that question, I think it's really tied to history, social identity, and kind of the politics of rural communities. And while that can be a benefit of having that social identity of being close and framing your programming um, around kind of that history and social identity, it can also be something that might exclude people. Also something that I would say is the kind of the use of like resources and infrastructure and social, um, sorry, in rural communities and sport and recreation. A lot of the times, like sport and recreation is in its own sector in rural communities. Um, it can be something that's like embedded where, you know, the example of like the curling club is also the community center and it acts as more things. So it's not always something that is separate and it can't always be compared when we're thinking of kind of like policy and politics of sport and recreation to urban centers or the different policies that are made in like strategic plans for sport and recreation, right? You have to consider that social. Um, context of the rural community and how it might differ and how the infrastructure and capacity would look different. Um, a lot of examples also were relying on volunteers um, to lead programming, to lead recreation programs, so those ideas of capacity come up a lot when talking to people. Yeah. Yeah, one of the quotes that I remember that stood out for me uh, from your data was someone being like, yeah, you know, like, we're a mill town and their family works at the yeah. mill and my family works at the mill and then that's how I got this job as a recreation director. Yes. And it was like all these things that were tied to like this history of them being like, oh, maybe that's why I don't know how to connect with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how embedded it is. And another 
example from my, my first, my undergraduate research, um, someone went to a council meeting and they were talking about putting funding towards like subways and streetcars and stuff. And he's like, well, I don't have a goddamn subway in my, like, in my community, so that's not going to benefit people getting to programming and getting to different things. So it, it's very embedded, uh, again, just coming back to that social history and political aspect in sport and recreation. You can't separate them. Awesome. And so why, in this context, why is sport and recreation important for communities? Why is it such an important I think there's all those wonderful benefits of sport and recreation that kind of are across the board of well-being, you know, your, your personal well-being, interconnectedness, and social connection. Um, coming together for like social action too, like when people come together for a project to put on some type of recreation program. I remember the example of uh, I'm speaking to my undergrad research actually a couple times right now, but it's, it's coming up of someone talking about how they really wanted to put on uh, a Christmas kind of gathering and party for their long-term care home and they didn't have the funding to do it, so they fully relied on the community and volunteers and someone's son who was a piano player to come in and play the music, you know what I mean? So I think that it's really important for that idea of connection and I think sometimes in the literature it was discussed where there might be more labor-intensive jobs in rural regions, it can be helpful for that recreation and leisure time to be something outside of that. It offers people a third a third place outside of like work or home to go and be able to um, do something separate and connect with the community. So I think that's where it can be really important in rural areas. Um, and so you use a really interesting kind of analysis process, you use in discourse analysis. So um, can you tell us, give us an example of one of the discourses related to social inclusion that came out of your research? Um, yeah. And explain like what that discourse, what are the discourse do, why is it important? Yeah, well, I'm trying to pick one because I have three <laughs> kind of key ones that, I, that came from my analysis, but I think it's also important to like state that I use a critical whiteness theoretical lens for this to understand how whiteness is embedded in the, the policy and the way people might be talking. And one of the discourses that um, came from my findings was we're all in this together. So that was something kind of a lot of people were talking about using more of a, a colorblind approach to sport and recreation in rural areas or saying, you know, we're all on the same playing field or when we all come into sport and recreation, you kind of leave everything at the door. And I think that's something that happens in sport and recreation in a lot of places um, where we kind of think that it's going to transcend any issues that we're having or systemic issues. Um, that are embedded into our system, and it's definitely not the case. And this was primarily coming up when I was asking people about how might new Canadians be included in your programming? What resources might they find? And a lot of times people were just saying, well, if anyone comes to the region, they have the same resources as anyone else, right? So it's kind of this idea of maybe thinking and maybe not speaking about the complexities of coming to a new region, a background, culture, ethnicity, race, and what ha implications that might have for feeling included in sport and recreation programming, and maybe wanting to ignore that because it might be a more complex uh, conversation, but it's very important to making sure people feel included. So I think, yeah, the ideas of maybe hegemony in rural areas and kind of people being the same or having these histories of working at the mill and these deep kind of social histories where they understand that can have implications for people feeling included. Yeah, and not only feeling included, but like, um, you know, there's no transportation in town. Yeah. Someone can't get to the program, but then we say, oh, everyone has the same opportunity. Exactly, like, yes. But if you literally can't get a driver's license for two years, yep. then you can't come to the program. Yeah, it's like feeling included, and it's the actual real physical barriers to that, like, make it happen to, to be able to get to the program and be involved. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so we also talk a lot about you know, gaps between policy and practice, and you looked at policy and policy makers and decision makers. Um, so what do these discourses help you understand about that policy practice gap, I guess? Yeah, I think the biggest gap that I found in my research was a lot of people were, when I was asking about specific social inclusion policy, like, do you have an example of social inclusion policy in your organization? People would say no, usually, and people would also say, like, I don't really know whose responsibility that is, like, to come up with social inclusion policy, to enforce social inclusion policy. I don't even know what that would look like. And I think that um, a lot of people would kind of say, like, it's embedded into our core values, but it's maybe not something we have specific policy on. 
Can you remind me of what the question was? That's part of the gap between policy. <laughs> yeah, so that's where I was going with this. <laughs> so I think there's a gap because people maybe more at the programming level might feel like it's not really their responsibility to understand where you could find social inclusion policy. If there even is a policy on social inc inclusion, like training, education, resources, right? Um, and so I think it's really important kind of thinking about that trip. So usually when I was speaking with managers, they would have a little bit more of an understanding, but still a bit of a gap. So you can see how maybe more like provincial or federal policy is starting to trickle down into different municipal areas, but there needs to be a bit more of a flow and transition between how people are understanding policy, practicing policy, because if you have a policy stated, as we know, but you don't do anything about it, that can be a problem. And that's what I'm seeing in document analysis, right? Like in people's plans and their culture guides, there was, we want, we think social inclusion is important for vibrant communities, like statements like this. But then when you're talking to practitioners, people are like, I don't know what a social inclusion policy is or really where to find one. So that's kind of where that gap takes place. Yeah, and probably exacerbated by, you know, having the one person who's the facilities manager and the Zamboni driver and the records yes. driver and wearing all of the mini hats at the same time. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Okay, one more before we uh, move on. Um, so, based on that, who should be responsible for social inclusion? Who is the where is the responsibility? Yeah, I, th I think it has to happen at every different level. It needs to be like a multidisciplinary approach. And I, I just kept thinking like. A lot of people would give the examples of, oh, we rely on our volunteers and our volunteers are so important. And then I thought, well, if people at like kind of the programming level or the director or managerial level don't know about social inclusion, like how are even volunteers going to know about it? So I think it needs to happen at every level, at municipal planning, policy makers within sport and recreation, directors, managers. And I know what we're talking about is it can be tricky when it's not necessarily a separate sector in a lot of rural community contexts. So we need to understand Again, like what we're talking about today is that social identity and understand how it might be different, but make sure that it can flow through different levels and different positions. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. And that's a great segue as we, we move along because, uh, you know, we know that demographics are changing, and particularly in the region where um, both of your research was. Um, there ha it was one of the sites for the Rural Northern, Northern Immigration Pilot Project. Mm -hmm. um, maybe your work looked specifically at one organization that had, I don't think they, it was necessarily through that project that they had done an LMIA um, and accessed uh, a group of uh, healthcare workers who were now working at the organization. Um, so I think people are interested to talk about this right now, right? Because they recognize that, okay, maybe we had a homogenous population for quite a long time, and that's no longer no longer the case, right? Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about that process, maybe, and tell us what the uh, the organization had done, what it what it looks like? I don't don't name the organization. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, so this organization, um, like he mentioned, they used um, LMIA. Are we from? Not sure we're familiar with like LMI, but it's like um, a license that organizations get to employ or bring in newcomer newcomers uh, or newcomer workforce. So like um, it, it allows them bringing people to work or filling like gaps in the organization that they don't have um, skilled workforce for at the time. So this organization used that means to bring in about 20, 18 to 20 of these newcomer healthcare workers to to fill in the gap in the workforce. Um, yeah, so for them, when when we talk or when I was in conversation with the people involved in this process, they expressed that it wasn't exactly difficult, like on their part, to bring in these people. Um, the process was straightforward, but when you bring them in, they realize that the the process to keep them or to, to make them stay, that's where it gets difficult. So for instance, um, you, you get the LMIA license to bring in people and they have to be temporary workers, like it's not a permanent arrangement. So when they come in, they're trying to make their stay permanent. And this is also like affecting them psychologically and affecting um, their adaptation in the community because their families are not there, they're trying to get a more permanent state to bring in their families, and the organization actually is working on helping them, like the organization that brought them in, um, works on helping them to 
to go through that process, but they, they've noticed that it does affect the way that or their approach to work, and then it, it also affects the way that like their day-to-day -day life because it's this thing that's at the back of their mind stressing them out. When the two year, it's usually two years, and when it elapses, what next? So figuring that out while also trying to adapt to a new community or a new environment. Um, it's always a challenge for these new comments. Did I answer the question? Yeah, um, I think just uh, bigger zoomed out things. It was the long term care home, and the workers were working as personal support yes, workers. Yes, personal support workers. Okay. Um, do, um, yeah, it was a long term care home, like you said, and they were working as personal support care workers. And I, it would also be important to mention that most of these people were registered nurses from where they were coming from. And so there's also like, um, this is not like usually the field that they would be in. So there's a lot of adjustment in that sense as well, because they are moving from being registered nurse, nurses to understanding um, personal support work. So. Cool. Uh, so the kind of theoretical approach that you've taken in the work is acculturation. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you just give us the 101 lecture? What is acculturation? Okay. <laughs> um, acculturation is like the, um, the changes that happen or the psychological and cultural changes that happen when two different or more two or more cultures meet. Um, so for my research, I would be using Barry's model. Um, so usually acculturation happens when in, in places where there are newcomers or, and host communities usually. And I'll be using Barry's model, which has um, or which specifies four processes. Um, integration where the newcomers are adapting to their to their communities and um, separation when they're not like they're giving themselves away and they're not trying to, to adapt. Um, assimilation where they're very much involved in what's happening and at the same time still also involved in what's happening, like still also involved with their own culture, like they're not letting go of their culture and they're also getting involved in it in their host culture. And then um, marginalization where they don't um, want any of any of the two. So yeah, those are the four processes that Barry emphasized. And I wanted to turn into talking about like the two um, how it's two sided. Uh, that's coming up. I know that oh. question. <laughs> yeah, so it's <laughs> it's um, so yeah it, it that's the 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 well, I say the I'm looking for the word that's guiding my 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 research acculturation theory. That's the theory guiding my research acculturation <laughs> theory. Awesome. And so, why is it uh, so pertinent right now to be um, understanding acculturation of newcomers in, in rural places? Okay. Um, so, looking at the the current um, political landscape, there has been like a lot of conversations about. Um, bringing in more and more people to fill the workforce in Canada. And um, one of the things I highlighted in my proposal was the, the statement by the government that they are trying to bring in 500,000 people by 2025. And so, and like she mentioned, one of the streams for that is the Rural Northern Immigration Pilot. And it's because the, they recognize that the rural areas are, um, are lacking in some skilled workforce due to like an, an aging population, out migration of, of younger people to urban areas. So they're trying to fill those gaps there and bring up a better infrastructure there. So I feel like that's why this, this is important because more people are moving there, the demographic is changing like we've talked about. Um, so it's important to understand how these two, the host communities and the newcomers, how they would adapt together to these changes that are happening. And this will also like help with um, making the transition easier for the, for the both parties. So like this would spur this, this research or it's important to have these conversations so that it could support um, policy changes or policy, um, policy making in that area towards making sure that the two sides, the host communities and the newcomers, um, adapt or transition easily. Cool. That's a really interesting example, right? Because it's a, it's a 
process that is largely directed by like federal policy, right? The federal policy making make a decision that impacts something that's happening almost exclusively at the community yeah. level, right? Yeah. And this acculturation process is, is all at the, at the community level. Mm -hmm. So an interesting kind of connection there and how that fits together. And I mean, regional too, to, a, to an extent, right? Because it's uh, a lot of the healthcare kind of It's all really interconnected. Yeah. Okay, so um, you use a case study for your, for your research. Uh, can you, and case studies are a lot about context, right? And understanding how the context shapes uh, the experiences. So how did the rural context of this long-term care home uh, shape people's experiences in your, in your project? Okay, um, so most of the people I talk to, so for context, or for more context, um, my interview population, or the, the population I interviewed, it was made up of the co-workers of the rural healthcare workers, community members, and the newcomer healthcare workers themselves. Um, uh, question, how did the rural context shape these groups? Yeah, um, so many times they, let me just, I mean, I feel like it's important to mention that this, where they're coming from was, is usually more urban. So may, many of them had worked in bigger cities, like as nurses, um, as even as far as Australia. And so when they when they come in, or when they come into these communities, it's a huge change for them. So especially uh, not only down to the community where I con conducted my research, there are no buses. Um, there is like the, the, the place where everything happens is like, the one community center, and um, it, it's very close knit, where everybody knows everybody. And then there's also the the very important part where the place where they work, the long term care home, is like the well, I say biggest employer in that community, and so there are also members of the community with family in the long term care home. So. I feel like all of these dynamics affect um, uh, how they carry out the, their jobs and how they're able to to adapt or relate with the people around them. Yeah. Cool. Can you give some examples? Because I think there were some really interesting examples of um, those interactions and the way that um, maybe community has supported people in doing Oh ways. yes, yes. Um, there. When, before they came in, um, they put up an announcement because there's like a, a Facebook group, the community has a Facebook group, and they were, they put out a call for people to um, donate things for the newcomers before they came. So there was a drive through and they didn't need to, it, it, in the winter, so there was like a lot of boots, coats, and I remember speaking to some of the newcomers, and that, that was like a big highlight for them, and they couldn't stop talking about how it made them feel when they came in to see that they had thought about them. I mean, they even went to the external, but like, didn't, because they, they do arrange a house for them when they come, um, so eventually they can move out of those houses. But they, they put, like, food in all the rooms for them, so, like, they just, um, they, they went the extra mile to just make them feel um, more welcome, and it really, like, stuck with them. When I spoke to the newcomer healthcare workers, it made them really happy and made them feel really welcome. That, that was like, I feel like a very interesting highlight. And then also, they would express how um, it was a bit more pressure to do their jobs when residents in the care home have families in the community who they can interact with or who they see in church or something. So I feel like that's another like interesting um, um, things that I like. Cool. Um, and uh, so the one thing we, we talked about is these you know, organizations or groups. Um, can you speak a little bit about where people were connecting um, outside of work? Like what, what did that look like? Okay. Um, I noticed when I spoke with many of them that because one, okay, one, I actually went to the community and there were so many events on the, in the community center, so many posters and flyers for events on the wall and I remember asking about it and they're like yeah like we have something happening like 
almost every single day. But then when I spoke to the newcomer healthcare workers, like how, trying to find out how engaged they were with these activities, they were mostly not very engaged. A couple of them would say, oh, I go to the gym sometimes. But the one place where everyone, where everyone went, was the um, the thrift shop in the community center. So, um, actually, like three different community members use the phrase, they like to shop. So, like, that's one place you would find them. Everybody you talk to be like, oh, you would find them at the thrift store. They would always be there shopping. Um, another place um, is the church. So, I, I realized that, like, third spaces like the church can be, like, a good place where they would um, feel welcome and so many of the people, many of the community members who talk to them outside of work would find them in church or truth shopping. So, yeah. But then I, I I realized that there was a, they didn't like really come out to those events. Um, so for instance, yoga class or um, a baking class, like they, they wouldn't come out for those events usually. When I asked why it was usually uh, usually due to time they would say they had shifts and usually when they're free they just want to not do anything or fill in their time with anything else there was also um complaints about the transportation like most times they want to go but it's cold and they don't want to do the 20 minute walk in the cold so yeah those are some of the factors that that made them not participate so much and i think aside from that there's also in closing communities like this, there's also the feelings of being an outsider. So sometimes you don't want to go because, except someone is going, so like, oh, I called so and so to come with me, and she wasn't available, so so I couldn't go. So most times they want to go with someone who they can relate with while they're there, or just a few more. Um, and the one interesting thing was also was that when you got there, you then found other newcomers who were there, and. Uh, that uh, work through this like process, right? So the priest at the church, for example. Oh yes, yes, yes. So um, I was trying. I was speaking to community members, like I said, and one of it was interesting to speak to the priest, who was also a newcomer. So he was a newcomer, so he had the perspective of a newcomer and a priest. Um, with him, I, I wouldn't say that his experience was exactly similar to the experiences of the newcomer of the workers because I mean with the priest from the get go he's um, he's very part of his work or part of his job is to get very adapted or very integrated with the community because like I mean that's that would um, determine how he carries out his job. So I feel like with with the priest it was his my conversation with him, I noticed that it was a bit different. Like he would make himself available um, because he felt that he needed to come um, connect with members of the community to actually be able to do that shit. So yeah, we, I feel like so that that makes me think that made me think about how like with different populations, I believe it would be a different outcome because I mean with the priests some of the challenges that they expressed. So for instance, the priest as well, having access to the car also made, um, made it easier for him, or having access to an accommodation when he came into the community made, also made like, the transition easier for him. So I feel like with different populations, it can be yeah, different. I love the shopping example. That's so interesting because yeah. there's nowhere else to get clothes in town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to and I did see a couple of them when I went to the <laughs> so, <laughs> Nice, nice. Cool. So you talk uh, in your in your work, you've talked about the sort of two-way acculturation, right? That it's not an old way, like it's not only newcomers mm -hmm. who acculturate when you know, yeah. community, but community members change as a result of having new people in the community. Um, so can you give some examples of what community members said about having you know a new new community members and how that's changed their community? Okay. Um, yeah, like acculturation is not one way. Like when two cultures meet they're both feeding off of each other. So it's it's reciprocal and um, I would say that an example I, I noticed was more between the co-workers of the newcomer healthcare workers and the newcomer healthcare workers. So um, the co-workers expressed a lot, like everyone I spoke to 
express the strong work ethic of the newcomer healthcare workers and how like it was rubbing up on them. And um, because the newcomer healthcare workers, okay, I'm trying to express it the way that so it doesn't come out wrong, but <laughs> they're um, they're new, right? And so most times, because they're trying to adjust to the situation and figure, like, when you come into a new place, um, sometimes they're trying to figure out, like, the best way to go about things. Like, when they've not understood the environment, they tend to be watchful before um, figuring out how to relate in that environment. So what I'm trying to say is, um, so for instance, when they come in, they don't say no to shifts. So when they're given shifts, they, they never say no, even when um, maybe it's um, it's a lot for them. So some of them express that they, they didn't say no. And so what this did was, for some of the co-workers, they noticed um, how how they would always be available. Like every time every time they're called to be on call, they would always be available. And I feel like. Not everyone. <laughs> so they, uh, what what I noticed from the data was that this also made the the co-workers, like the ex the pre-existing co-workers, to be more available because they didn't want the organization or the management to feel like they were more lax at their own jobs. Does this answer the question? Yeah, like, so I I like that. that right yeah. So it's, yeah, you can just get it. Answer, yeah, that's so like it also even when I spoke with one of the member of the management, they were like they did notice that um, people were not really very oh I, I don't want to do that shift I don't want to like people were more willing to take on shifts so they yeah so they sat up and yeah so I feel like that's a, a great example of how the both sides can feed off feed off of each other. Oh, awesome, thank you. I'm going to flip over to John now. Um, I hope you're ready to follow up these uh, acts. <laughs> awesome. So, John, your work, you looked at uh, mutual aid in third spaces. We heard a little bit about third spaces here. Um, can, can you just give us the kind of one on one lecture? What is mutual aid and what are third spaces? So, I'll start with mutual aid and I'll move on to third places. Um, so, the whole, because uh, this is my master's research, right? And so, I had a huge section devoted to actually like kind of unraveling what these things are because mutual aid for a lot of people is a more political concept and since it is so decentralized um, when it comes to defining it people have different definitions and they vary from place to place there is kind of a, a kind of seminal body of literature luckily um, but I had to kind of look to more like historic accounts of it contemporary seminal literature and stuff as well but more or less uh, mutual aid is based there's a saying in mutual aid, if you look to authors like Dean Spade, solidarity, not charity, right? So whereas something like charity, when it comes to caring economies, can basically decide who is and isn't worthy of receiving help or care, mutual aid involves relationship building with people around you in your community, filling in policy and program gaps, building communities of resilience and resistance. It can be a really effective tool, especially in times of crises, um, like the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so brief, brief, you know, um, historically speaking, if you look to like really early accounts, and I should also mention that mutual aid has been practiced in a lot of marginalized communities, um, and even in its geography, regardless of community, it's not always called that explicitly. People coming together, relationship building, and making sure their needs are met certainly is a, a broad concept, to say the least. But there are instances of mutual aid in, in, in nature, um, of animals helping each other, both within and between species as well, right? And that was an observation, like, early 1900s. Uh, mutual aid literature, like Peter Kropotkin and stuff. But I'm, yeah, but moving on. Um, so really interesting, especially in a time of crisis. Um, I was interested in kind of the intersection between that and third places. And you two have mentioned third places. My ears perked up. Um, so I'll just go over, I'll like do, run through the motions for anyone that's not really privy to it. So basically, um, sociologist Ray Oldenburg kind of more or less coined this kind of concept of third places. Um, and in this third place model, first places would be the home, second places 
uh, the workplace, and then third places are these kind of in-between uh, places uh, in a community where people might come together, exchange knowledge, where cultural capital is, is generated, where people establish a sense of place. Um, so it's really compelling for a lot of things. And Ray Oldenburg himself has said that third places are really good spots for things like mutual aid societies. Right? So that was kind of a, a connection there, like linking those two bodies is actually like pertinent to begin with. Um, really interesting is kind of the kind of turn in terms of the theory of that around the 21st century, the turn of the 21st century is being, kind of became more and more you know, popularized. Um, and this idea of digital uh, third places. Um, and so I'm going to maybe get into this a little bit later, but online designated places for people to kind of fulfill those same, if not similar, functions. Um, and yeah, and so I was interested in kind of seeing how that all fit into like an Atlantic Canadian context, but maybe I'll leave it. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to say. Um, so maybe you just got to build on that. Why, what does this look like in rural communities and how is it different from an urban context? Yeah, so I mean, I think I should also mention too, um, in terms of Nova Scotia, if you look at like data from about a decade ago. I remember reading the State of Rural Canada 2015, the Nova Scotia chapter. <laughs> and I think uh, Nova Scotia had some of the highest volunteer rates in, in the country. Um, it varies between age demographics in terms of how many hours are devoted and how many different like, volunteering obligations uh, you know, are uh, met. But um, what was the question again? Um, how is, what are these look like in rural communities? How are they different? Yeah, there's like barriers and stuff, which is really interesting. So when you're in rural, there's Definitely a bunch of policy and program gaps is a reason why we have all these rural researchers doing all this compelling research and whatnot, right? Um, things like mobility, access to markets, and stuff like that, too. Um, so when it comes to filling in those policies and program gaps, and another thing, too, if you look to like, researchers like Bill Reimer, like new rural economy stuff, like a lot of the policy in Canada and the United States is like piecemeal. Like it's a universalist kind of approach, right? Like one size fits all and place matters. Like we said earlier, like you see one small town, you see one small town. That's echoed again and again throughout our field. Um, and so like, I think that like, <laughs> what is different than urban? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I was talking about kind of these things in rural. So it's really um, important. It's a powerful tool when it comes to rural communities to make sure people's needs are met. And you will see community coming together in venues like church is a popular third place in rural communities. At the same time, like you mentioned again, there are like mobility issues as well, which is where that digital piece comes into play. And it's really compelling. Of course, there's still gaps in terms of things like broadband access for a lot of rural especially remote people, um, but it's a powerful tool. Urban areas is typically where you see more projects that are self-identified as like mutual aid groups occurring. People have easier access to meet up, to collaborate, to organize accordingly. Um, but I think, too, when we think of the bigger picture, what mutual aid looks like, it's not always those distinctly organized groups that might call themselves as such. Sometimes it's just neighbors coming together, shoveling your neighbor's driveway, looking out for one another. Um, so yeah, yeah. And some of the some of the original new rural economy stuff is about the informal economy, right? That's yeah, exactly. The same thing, right? And so this is like a caveat of that, like a little like a like a subsection yeah. or we can care. I'll watch your kids eating a pie. Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so tell us a little bit about what you find. Tell us about your research, what you use, and the findings. The findings of the research, yeah. So it, it, it was interesting, again, again, the context of this was the COVID-19 pandemic. And doing a scan really, and again, like there were a lot of groups don't identify themselves as mutual aid groups. So I had to do some digging and identify several key actors to look at. Um, the vast majority of them spawned as a reaction to pressures put on people um, by the pandemic. And just for context, I think Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, and uh, maybe to a lesser extent, Newfoundland and Labrador had some pretty like intense uh, public health measures to keep people safe. I think in a per capita sense, we had some of the lowest rates of COVID in North America, outside of maybe like the territories or something. Um, so, but with that too came distance, right, between people. Um, so that a lot of the groups fall out of like the needs of people, whether that be like uh, goods or services, etc. Um, <laughs> what were some of your findings? My findings? Oh yeah. Um, so the findings, like 
So yeah, most groups uh, popped up as a response to the pandemic. A lot of them ended up withering away past like the peak or whatever. Um, we saw a lot of rural people coming together. I was looking at the frequency because I, I did an e-survey as part of like my data collection, and a lot of rural respondents because uh, I did like a before and after the pandemic began or whatever, and a lot of like rural people. A lot of these are like polarized too. It's like either people, a lot of people either don't participate or frequently engage with this, but these were really stressed with the pandemic. And so um, honestly, the results weren't like too surprising. Rural people, people, you know, by the pandemic came together. A lot of marginalized communities also came together. I think with LGBTQ plus people, like their frequent participation in each really quadruple in the face of the pandemic is one example. Um, so a lot of interesting highlights there. Yeah, at the time of crisis where, you know, policies and programs fail us even more as a time when people come together. Um, and again, like I said, a lot of these projects eventually kind of trickled out, you know, as you kind of move deeper into things and people were like, oh, we're past the peak. Um, and when I talk to a lot of more politically involved people that speak about things like mutual aid, they see that as some sort of um, failing. Um, I don't think so personally. I think if you look to um, community economic development and social movement scholars in Canada, like Eric Schrag, the social movements are are transient, right? They don't last forever. And that doesn't mean that they don't contribute to some sort of grander narrative or progress, but it kind of stacks, right? And so for a lot of these groups, there was a need that needed to be met, and to varying extents, they met those needs. So. Yeah, cool. Um, so we've alluded to it a few times, you, you alluded to it as well. How do you think the Atlantic Canada context shaped your your research and you know, how is it different there than it is? So yeah, so in terms of like the broader geographies of caring economies, it's super compelling because of that volunteering piece as an example. I think also uh, to the rural dimension of that, I see Atlantic Canada and Maritimes more specifically as like a highly peripheral and less rural region. Like yeah, we have cities. I think there are also instances of the rural in the urban spaces as well. So <laughs> getting into that what is a rural conversation, I won't crack that open because that can get pretty <laughs> yeah, pretty fast. Um, but it was it was just compelling to me because I think too, when you compare it to other Canadian jurisdictions, especially with those stronger um, public health measures in place, that to a lot of people like, exacerbated certain needs and whatnot. Um, and of course, me, me being from the Maritimes, I was more intimately acquainted with the region as well. Um, but I think a lot of this kind of coming together really echoes kind of the economic position that the Maritimes have kind of been pigeonholed in within like the last 100 years. A lot of like political discourse and um, you know like everyday like social discourse as well come like surrounds this kind of uh, peripheral status that it has in terms of a larger Canadian economy. Um, and I, I don't think I have time to get into like the specifics here, but I, I draw a lot of like more domestic parallels to um, things like uh, kind of this core periphery relationship that you see in like the field of international development studies, as an example. Now, mind you, that's not as exacerbated or extreme, right? Like the difference in wealth between Nova Scotia, a place like Ontario or Alberta, certainly is not the same. Uh, as a like core economy state and like one that is is developing and are, you know suffering like from the neocolonial apparatus, but um, I think that just that relationship that dynamic uh, really added an interesting historical backdrop and kind of provided like a narrative as to like where the Maritimes were and then where they are now uh, here at the peak of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of where that. Came in, yeah, cool. Um, and then I'll start this one with you, and then maybe move back through everyone. Uh, but what do you think the next research in this area should look like? What should the future researchers be? There, there's, there's, a, there's a few things. Again, like I parsing through the literature, there was nothing really on mutual aid in terms of that geographic scope. Um, I think there were some things that I had to admit, so like community pantries and fridges and stuff. Um, you know, in terms of food security, that's really rich for research. Um, it just did not fit into like my data collection. Um, so that is one area that could be looked at. Um, the thing is too, is that again, like there aren't that many on the ground. So a comparative piece might be interesting as well, either within a Canadian or an international context. 
and maybe also digging into what that looks like outside of the pandemic context or outside of that, you know what I mean? Because um, that those geographies might look different from moment to moment they're ever evolving to so kind of respond to the immediate needs of, of, of a community. So, yeah. Cool. Maybe what's the next research? Uh, yeah, I would say looking at um, newcomers and the housing situation in rural areas. Um, housing was a big problem because when I spoke to the management of the long-term care home, they talked about how like they've had a very great experience with the newcomers and they want to employ more, but they cannot. And it's just because of housing. Like that's the sole reason because there's nowhere to put them. There's nowhere for them to stay. So that I feel like is like really important because if we're saying that these people should or we're trying to expand uh, the demographic in rural areas, we have to be making um, room for accommodation for them when they escape. So I feel like that was a really important bit. Um, that, that right, yeah. yeah, that's such a big complex problem too. Right? Like, there's no, um, there's no mix of housing in a lot of rural places, right? It's like only homes. Yes, only homes exactly. You can rent, so. Cool. Uh, I think I was focusing on kind of Nipissing and Sudbury District because of North Bay and Sudbury being participating in the rural and northern immigration pilot. I think it'd be interesting to talk to other remote and rural communities who maybe aren't participating to understand like their understandings of social inclusion and newcomers of the region um, to get that perspective. Also, more remote communities to understand like different social identities. Of course, you know one rural area, you know one, but just. Uh, kind of keep expanding that. And then also, of course, I was understanding the perspective of like sport and recreation practitioners and managers. So the perspective of new Canadians and newcomers um, with how they feel included in sport and recreation and what sport and recreation might mean to them. And that perspective is, of course, really important to continue with uh, this type of research. Yeah, some synergies there with what they're just talking about. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Our, our Absolutely. Awesome. So right on time here, I do want to open it up now. I got some other questions I can throw your way, but I want to open it up to the floor and leave lots of time for, for discussion if people have it. Um, do we have any questions or comments online? Not yet. Okay, perfect. Uh, so let's open it up to the floor then. Does anybody have questions for our panelists? For me, I guess. <laughs> From Vivian. Okay. So is LMI a labor market intermediary? Um, or is it, um, is it like manpower or like a kind of a corporate organization that brings people in? Or? No, it's, um, yeah, now that, now that I'm on the spot, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> the pool actually, but it, it's, um, it's, it's a government policy. Okay. Yeah, so it's, um, LMI is like a license that they give to organizations to bring in um, skilled workers. Okay. But there's a kind of, like, you can't, it has to be that you cannot find anyone in Canada to fill that role. Okay. So you have to put out an advert for the role, an ad for the role for I think a minimum of three months. Okay. And then when you can't find, and you go to the government and say, oh, I've put it out and I can't find anyone. And then they give you um, the permission to get people from outside to come to the end. So okay. Labor market impact assessment. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's good. Good. <laughs> And now, in that case, it was that's separate from the rural and rural Yes, yes. And we think we thought, we assumed it. You assumed it would be the, approach. but then they did say that um, they they're trying to use the RNIP to make their stay more permanent. Right. So I feel like that's where they tied together. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we assumed when we approached the organization because they were close to the set of the RNIP yeah. that they would have used that program for the yeah. had. So. But they, they use a different game. Yeah, mm -hmm. which was an interesting. And they are planning to explore that more for the next. Yeah, and that's probably an interesting, like, kind of political dynamic, too, like, um, you know, what do these different programs do and how do they shape the processes? You know, maybe do we just need to build capacity within rural organizations to access the LMIA that's already the mechanism that we have? Right, and, yeah. Sure. Cool. Any other questions?
I got one I could talk to you. I'm like, I want to my findings a bit more. Because like, you know when you like finish a presentation, you're like, oh, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Perfect. Yes. So going back to the whole digital third places piece, and one major finding was that the best, like, about half of the case studies I looked at um, were either hosted within a digital third place. A lot of like community Facebook groups popped up to coordinate mutual aid efforts to exchange like public health information and stuff like that, which was super vital. Um, and an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, with regard to the digital third spaces, do you find that um, some of the actual local news or local event um, can be lost in just the sheer volume of uh, digital spaces and the amount of information? Yeah. So there's definitely like a lack of intimacy in those places. Usually, with when you think to like mutual aid groups, it's more in person, and I think part of the disconnect associated with that kind of also indicates that well. These digital third places fill in gaps like mobility, right? Like especially in rural areas where people can't necessarily organize that easily, right? They're not necessarily a replacement for physical third places either, where you make those in, in person connections. But I don't think I answered your question, so could you <laughs> repeat it, please? <laughs> I was just asking um, if you saw any difficulties for um, for online the creation of third spaces, uh, whether or not that be the network connection or actually like getting to events, just because of the sheer volume. And I mean, we can talk about yeah. algorithms for social certain social media sites, but it's more about just like the volume. Does it ever the local news get lost in that? Like, did you find yeah. specific? So because of the, the kind of timeline of that being like peak pandemic and, and the public health restrictions that we did have, events weren't so much pertinent. And then for that other first piece that you mentioned, um, the access to that. So I did mention in the research kind of exploring like access to broadband and then also the question of older adults that might not have the digital literacy to access these groups. So those are certainly barriers to entry when it comes to this, along with like the scale or whatever. Um, at the same time, the actual accessibility to pop these groups up and like people's tendency to drift towards them is much more easier than trying to organize people in person in most instances to the so pros and cons. And, I'm, I'm curious like to build on that digital space thing is a double-edged sword, right? So while oh, yeah. it allows you to yeah. like build capacity for mutual aid and also for solidarity and also um, builds capacity for polarization. Did you see examples where people were organizing mutual aid in response to uh, like digitally organized polarization campaign? Uh, or, you know, so, so all the case studies I did, most of them were either like organizing, like, hey, like, I need help doing this, but I can't because maybe I have COVID or something like that, or it was exchanging. It wasn't so much polarization because its explicit purpose was to like there was one out in Pico County, so very rural Nova Scotia, where they would basically exchange public health information as it would come in, and a lot of these groups actually had someone in more like an organizational position, which is super common for social movements and stuff. So that was a parallel there to like that abstract literature. Um, yeah, well, I, I have an example. I mean, actually, one of the things you looked at earlier with your case study, what well, this community Facebook page is like absolute chaos. But it's like there's lots I of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things was when they were advertising, I believe, for the Coke campaign. Yes. Um, somebody had commented something about newcomers coming to take our jobs, and it was. Amazing oh watching the like, yes. people in the community be like, Do you want to work yeah. here? Here's the application. They want, they they want like, this person. Yeah, yeah. That and then was, they like, took them down. Yeah. And it was quite interesting actually to see that like rhetoric come out. Mm -hmm. And then the people who actually knew about this process and like how this was filling an important yeah. um, gap were all over that. <laughs> it, was, yeah. like, it also like makes me think about how it's important to also get the community involved in this. Like, it, I mean, I feel like maybe that person who left that comment wasn't really knowledgeable about, or they didn't have the information on the need for for these people who were coming in. So I feel like there's also that sensitization that mm -hmm. needs to be done um, so everyone has like information on what's really happening. Yeah. The purpose of and then that's what yeah, yeah, yeah. digital spaces open up all these opportunities for people to just throw in their two cents when yeah. they really shouldn't yeah. be throwing in their two cents. And it can 
I'm still well. I will profess one of the things I enjoy in my free time is reading small town Facebook drama. <laughs> Luckily, due to the really like specified nature of these groups, it was largely exempt from that. So that's the silver lining here. Yeah. I can also see it was, it was really yeah. interesting. Like I just kept scrolling. <laughs> I don't want to deviate this from online forums and, and the pieces. Um, as you were, so thanks for the for the discussion. It's been really interesting. I have a big question for all three of you to see if you have solutions. Um, but one of the messages that I've written down constantly throughout the conversation has been this notion of agency. Um, whether it's the social fabric, whether it is the interconnectedness, the people, the, the networking. And my question is. Is government a help or a hindrance in this sphere? And from each of your own three examples, is government a helping in this nature or a hindrance to this? Because much of the work around agency that you've described has been often facing resistance to or in resilience of the lack of government. So I'm curious, from your perspective, is government helping or hindering kind of the social infrastructure? At the end of the day, and I'm hoping you might be able to think about, you know, if there was government people in the room, what would we say to them with how to support social infrastructure for rural, northern, remote communities? Can I go first? Yeah. Going back to the mutual aid discourse again, there's a lot of people's purest notion that has to be completely decoupled from like other systems and whatnot. But the reality on the ground, a lot of these groups collaborate with other uh, public, private, and civil society actors. I think um, I'm thinking to uh, one case study up inside called New Brunswick Community Connects, and basically uh, not Allison universities up there. And what they would do is they got a micro grant to actually fund this project, basically. And they'd connect uh, post-secondary students with isolated seniors. And there was quite a few in town because that's like a basically a provincial border town, like right, so I don't know, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia border, right? So you have a bunch of seniors in a demographic that's already like oh, you know overwhelmingly isolated compared to the general population, and then put this on top of it. And so there was a need there. And so that would not have been as easy to do without that funding, as an example. Um, so while a lot of these projects Arguably, all of them arose out of these policy and program gaps and the either uselessness or harms of different levels of government. There's still ways to build partnerships or leverage resources from these pre existing institutions. And I don't think that that undermines kind of the spirit of mutual aid. Like, if you can make it easy, like, why would you play on a hard mode, right? Like, take advantage of what you can, right? So, but it's about understanding the context in that case, yeah. like the social context, history, political, and not just generalizing it or putting a brushstroke over exactly. of what an urban area or community might need, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that policy-wise, um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't want to say they're a hindrance or not, but I feel like many times there are these policies, but um, when it comes really comes down to it, it. it what it looks like we're they're thinking more big picture, but no one is trying to like look at the nitty gritty. So, for instance, we're saying, oh, there's a healthcare crisis in, in Canada, and we need to, I mean, the healthcare workforce is reducing, and we need to bring in skilled people to fill in those roles. But then, when those people come in, they their credentials are not recognized, so they're starting from scratch, and many of them don't want to go through that process of getting their credentials recognized and so they give up into other careers. So like I feel like it's it's just a, it, it has like the snowball effect. So even with oh we need more people in rural areas, but there are no houses for them to stay. So how how do we like aside the big picture, how do we bring it down to actually making sure that these policies are actually can be actualized here? I think in your case, Vivian like I don't know how a uh, rural long-term care home in Northern Ontario would ever access the international workforce without the mechanism of government. Yeah, yeah. They certainly yeah. didn't go to recruit people in person and would never be able to. Mm -hmm. So there's also those kind of like enablers that none of this would exist without, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's like, I, I wouldn't say that they're exactly a leader in solar, but I feel like, yeah, it, it, they're, they're doing something that needs to be done, but it could, it could be enhanced. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm trying to think in the context of like my own research, I agree with that. I think that it's something you can definitely leverage, but I'm just thinking of these examples of people might have kind of a 
the people I've talked with in the context might have kind of a negative perspective towards government or say, like, I remember the quote, some bureaucrat down in Toronto is making policy for me up here in the north. So I think, like, addressing that and just kind of understanding more of what I was saying to John's comment there about, like, social political context within regions and like how that might differ is really important because that's the only way things will get leveraged and like actual uh, needs at the programming level at whatever level you might be looking at will transpire so yeah I don't know I'm trying to I think, and I think a thread that I'm kind of hearing through all of it is like it's this multiple levels of government yeah government, right and it's understanding whose role is what in all of these things and how do we do them all together I think that's an age-old policy problem yeah. <laughs> yeah. Panel. We're not going to go solve it in our careers. Um, but there's these different levels, and everybody has roles to play. It's how we get them kind of working together. Yeah. And people, I think, you know, the resistance to government is part of the like rural narrative forever as well, right? Um, but in reality, sometimes there are like unhinged people who get into these roles and they need to be sheltered from like, <laughs> tearing the system down as right. well. Right? Sometimes you get that, that crazy mayor who's <laughs> like, like turn it all down. So like we need to make sure that those people are still gonna have a community left when that person moves on and be assigned that wasn't yeah. the approach. Yeah. So and I think that's the you know that's why we have institutions, right? Institutions are there to protect people from themselves in, in some ways. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> we should decide to see things like this for <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Anything you want to throw to the group? I have one that I want to put across. Um, what was your experience like doing student research on rural issues? You've all got like different you know, positionalities, things are coming through. Maybe in particularly for you, you know, coming as an international student and then going to Northern Ontario to like yeah. uh, put you on the bus and was like, bye. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love yeah. to know a little bit about that, what your experience as a student doing this work and what you might offer to another student who wants to do grad work in this kind of context. Because it's not like you're doing the, you know, the psychology study where you just like recruit a bunch of friends to do a little like, Response test and write your pieces on it. I think, yeah, okay, we'll go back to that one. Okay, I think my, my experience was like right when the pandemic started, and so everything had to be online. I couldn't really go anywhere to um, get that experience of maybe more in person discussions and whatnot. So it was interesting, and because of that, and because of the nature of sport and recreation, and when things would reopen and close and reopen and close, people were very overwhelmed with having to think of different programming to do virtually, think of different programming to do in person, and it really made a challenge with being able to get participants for the study. I remember I was on a call with someone, I'm like, yeah, I just need about an hour of your time. An hour? Like, I don't have an hour right now. I have to do all this programming and planning, so I was like, Maybe I need to wordsmith that a bit. So that was a, just an interesting experience where time and capacity is already a challenge in rural communities. It's already a challenge in sport and recreation, and then you throw a pandemic on top of it. That's a challenge too. Um, yeah, and just kind of being a student, my positionality within the research was, it was just an interesting to navigate, like even using that critical whiteness theoretical lens to kind of think about discourse and how certain things are being said and not taking them as just kind of normal or natural or neutral and actually really teasing apart what these things might mean, how they connect to like a broader discourse was very interesting for me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that it was interesting for me as well. Um, it was. I was a bit worried at, about getting people to talk to or people who would be interested. So I feel like that that was my worry, and of course my supervisor, who we, we might all know, it was <laughs> every time. So it, it was. Um, it was my challenge, or at the back of my head, I was just concerned about getting people who would want to talk to the student research, and. Um, so one time I was speaking to one of the newcomers and she was like, oh, I thought you were a therapist. <laughs> okay. So like one, I, I think I mentioned that I was a student and well, you know, as a researcher, you also like read body language and it was like, oh, so I mean, I thought you were maybe an expert or something. So there was, there was that, that there. And yeah, I feel like maybe as a student researcher, like Grace said, um, it might be important to know how to fine tune your your language, and um, so that the people who you're speaking to um, will understand or can see and 
that this is like really important work that you're doing and mm -hmm. you're not just trying to tick off a box in your course outline or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that it would actually like be interested or see the impact that your your work could have. So yeah. And then also like traveling, I feel like it was interesting for me. I, I mean I would recommend to someone um, who comes in, I would recommend because it was good to go to um, another military, see see what it's like uh, living there. It was a good experience for we had to uh, had to go send a DM on Instagram to get the Airbnb person to walk their Airbnb person. <laughs> that was the one Airbnb. Yeah, the, the one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, uh, yeah. Levers there, some, levers some social capital to get yeah. nominated. <laughs> That's why I said um, with the help of my supervisor, who <laughs> <laughs> might not know. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, COVID nineteen really impacted what research I did and also the research design surrounding. That. So it's a really unique circumstance. I think also just the fact of being a junior researcher and really worried about my positionality, the fact that researchers can, while trying to help create harm, and that again that influenced you know uh, both the subject matter and how I approached um, how I approached this research. But again, uh, multiple multiple reasons there, multiple pieces. Um, in terms of just like general commentary on. on on being like a, a younger researcher and working away at a document such as uh, as a thesis, like I think it's a it's a great time to also leverage like you know build your capacity as a researcher to be able to collaborate with other people in your field and whatnot. Um, and I think this is not a, an experience just relegated to me, but reading back at an old thesis and dissertation is a very sobering experience to say <laughs> the least. So. Um, uh, there were multiple periods during my writing process where I kind of slept on it, came back, was like, oh my god, and then came back. And even then, like, reading it now, I'm like, I mean, some parts are nice, but other parts, I'm like, oh my god, I, should, I, I wish I could touch this again. Um, so, bearing that in mind, staying humble, I guess. <laughs> but, cool, well, um, that's all the questions that I have. I mean, does anybody have any final ones we want to put? Sure. Yeah, I thought one really quick one. I'm curious for all three, John. I know your context a little bit better, um, but how did you build social capital and, and trust and stuff with the participants, especially those that went to Northern Ontario? So neither of you really had exposure to Northern Ontario before, and it can. I've done research there. I know how sometimes like, well, you're from Southern Ontario. Like, why are you here? And John, you can also of course speak to your experiences in Eastern Canada. But I'm just curious how you built that with the participants. Uh, for me, I noticed it really started to happen through that idea of, I guess you can say, like snowball sampling. Like, as soon as I got the one interview in, and they were like, oh, this is a great discussion. I'm going to pass it along to the, the person I work with or the person who I know works. It really helped to continue on that pattern of like getting different people to talk with. Um, so it kind of was like that one start to build a little bit of trust with one person. And I guess that's kind of the nature of the rural community, the tight knit community. They were able to kind of pass along that information. Um, and that was really helpful because I remember I was so worried about getting that first one and then you did and then all of a sudden all these other emails are coming in, oh, I'm interested in participating as well. So I think that was helpful. Yeah. I would say that I would like to emphasize on what you said about trust. Um, I remember speaking to the first um, new government of the worker and they were not exactly sure um, at first, even when, like when I said, oh, it would take um, about an hour of your time. Like, I could see concern, but after the conversation, it's like, oh, it wasn't so bad. And they actually did tell their friends who yeah. who then reached out. So I feel like, yeah, it's important to build that trust and make sure that they are comfortable and you have, like, a, a conversation with them that, and you understanding, like, the, you might call it the power play involved, and be sure not to, um, to have a conversation in a way that they would feel like, oh, this was nice and this would be helpful to me, and then they, they pass it along. Also, like, I feel like social capital was really, really, um, really, really helpful for me um, because I don't think I would have been able to enter that community and do anything because you know how rural, they, they're really close knit, and I feel like having an entry way um, also really helps me. Yeah. Yeah, so for both of these two, we had like people inside that we were using as well. Yeah. Um, some really enthusiastic insiders who were able to 
Oh, the names out and yeah. Yeah. sets and stuff up as well. So. Can I add one more thing? <laughs> <laughs> I also think with my topic of like social inclusion, sometimes it would make people a bit uncomfortable and they were worried about like saying the wrong thing or if they didn't know policy, they, people would often say, is that bad? Is that bad that I don't know it? So it just took a little bit more time and also learning on my part to build out more trust at the beginning of the interview and to really learn about their social identity and history and ask more questions about their community so they could feel like at the end, I'm really trying to understand the whole picture. I'm not just trying to, you know, put you on the spot and get you to name off a social inclusion policy. So I think also the context of the topic matters too and how you build that trust throughout the interview process or whatever you're doing. We had some big discussions with community members about what to put the title of the project does because that's what goes yes. on. And I'm like, there's no way we're putting critical whiteness studies as the, the title because we'll just scare yeah. people away. Like, yeah. it actually just scare yeah. people away. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're not going to use that lens, but like, that does not need to be the title. Yeah. The totally. Way. So, considering those things too. Sorry, John. Uh, <laughs> that's yeah, 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 like, similar snowballing and whatnot from my other research project system. Again, pandemic and stuff was more e surveying, content analysis oriented. Um, but yeah, with those semi structured interviews, like building your way up to maybe more intense questions so that the person that you're interacting with is a bit more comfortable. Yeah. Um, yeah, is part of that, I think. At least a smaller part of that larger trust right. building, that's for sure. But other times it's just like pulling people, honestly, <laughs> as well, trying to hound like municipal officials and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mixed bag. Maybe you're right back to you all eager and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's two ways to right? So our other uh, colleague, she did her fourth year thesis. Um, Northern Ontario tried to get municipal councillors, could not get a single one to talk to her. Was it, like tapping her like relatives who were municipal councillors, and they wouldn't even do the interview. Right. Uh, like felt bad. And, but then we had another one person who was looking at Southern Ontario and. Uh, I think people were off for the pandemic, like rec things were closed. So he had people like lining up because they were like, Oh yeah, happy to talk, like yeah. the programming was closed. So it's such a such a tough thing, you know, for sure. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Well thank you everyone. Let's give a round of applause for you.